My name is Lane Yancey, and I'm going to tell my story about growing up in a Baptist church, all the traumas that I experienced and what that led to, and where I am today. I grew up in a Christian household. My parents were extremely conservative. My dad was very, very strict. He did the corporal punishment. Corporal punishment is just basically spanking. There's different types of spanking, like a belt or like a switch. I know like Michelle Duggar, they would use like glue sticks. My dad just used his hand. I don't even remember what I would get spanked for, but I just got spanked. My mom, she grew up with a Christian family. She had a lot of anxiety and she was afraid of everything. And I was just always scared of them. My church was, and my demographic was very much influenced by the IBLP. The headquarters was in Illinois. It's no longer there, but that's where it was back in the 90s. With purity culture and the IBLP, they have a lot of emphasis on saving your for marriage. And that's kind of where purity culture gets started. I consider it purity culture to be because it is complex trauma, trauma that you were experiencing over a long period of time. They start in when you're probably around eight, nine, they separate the boys and the girls in church. So that's kind of like the beginning of it. As you start to get a little older, they start to really, really get down on like, you need to dress modestly. Like they still tell you when you're a kid, but they start to explain it like, you don't want to attempt the men in the church. You don't want to cause your brothers to fall. Well, now looking back, I'm like, that's disgusting. I was a 10 year old. Like, why am I thinking about that? And so once you get into like, you know, preteen, they really start to push. They start talking to you about like becoming the wife and saving your heart for marriage, saving yourself for marriage. It's even like thinking, like if you have a thought about liking someone, like you are giving pieces of your heart away. If you're flirting too much or like there was so much pressure. I was terrified of how I could approach boys, how I could talk to them. And then over time, when you're a teenager, they really put emphasis on and saving your for marriage. They have us sign a card. I think the first time I signed it, it was probably 13 years old. We kind of have like a special service at the church. I basically would be signing my virginity over to my father, who was also under God. It even says this in the Bible, your body is not your own. So this is something I was taught. My body was not mine. It was the Lord's. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. My father is like my protector who will give me, who will basically choose my husband for me. And I have to just wait. I have to wait for my husband. My mom used to tell me that I was a precious china doll in a box, that I had to stay in this special box until the right man came for me, until I got married. If anything opened the box or anything happened, I could be ruined. And the reason why I call this is because you are developing. This is when your body is developing puberty. You learn to suppress your sexuality. You aren't allowed to explore your own body. You aren't taught proper education. It's just don't have before marriage, you know, and that just messes up your brain chemistry and the wiring in your brain. You learn to literally be disassociated. So it took me a really long time for me to figure out that something was not right. I was homeschooled. I was extremely sheltered. And so I wasn't exposed to the outside world. So I thought this was normal from the age when you don't have critical thinking skills yet. You're basically taught not to think, but what to think. Growing up, having to memorize all this scripture in my head as a child, it was a struggle of part of me wanting to get out and just scream and want to be a normal kid. Whereas the other side was terrified, terrified of my parents, terrified of God, scared of everyone and anything outside of the church because things are demonic. So it was not until I was 28 that it actually clicked in my brain that this was, everything was wrong. But I think it took a long time for me to slowly learn this because I was so indoctrinated. I did not question anything at that time. I thought my parents were perfect. There are purity balls. There were purity balls that went on at certain churches. Different churches do different things. I have friends from other churches that literally would have weddings where they would wear a white dress, and they would have a wedding ceremony with their father. Luckily, mine was not that extreme. I was just signing a card 
um, with True Love Weights, and it was just like a special service. I find it wild that we had grown men teaching us young girls that we were the gatekeepers of our virginity and abstinence of not just our virginity, but the men. And I find it very, very creepy that it was the men that we had to be afraid of. The men in the church, the grown men. It's so creepy because we're children and we are the gatekeepers and we have to not tempt the older men in the church. Like that is wild to me and disgusting and it's grooming and it's just so gross. When we moved out to the suburbs, I was put into public school. It was a huge culture shock for me. I was so innocent. I did not understand the concept of swear words. So I learned those for the first time because I thought stupid was a bad word. I remember in the lunchroom at one point I had to sit next to a boy. I was having a mini panic attack inside my entire body because I thought that I was sinning because I was sitting next to a boy eating lunch. I did not have proper social skills. I was bullied a lot, but this is where I was. I got my first exposure to the world and this being like, whoa, like, all these people are sinners. I have to be afraid of all of these people here. So that was really terrifying. I really struggled with school and my grades and just focusing. And I used to thought I think I was stupid. Like I thought I was so stupid because I struggled getting good grade. But I realized now I was just couldn't focus. I had so much anxiety. When I was 15, I went to youth camp. I was a freshman in high school. I met a guy there. I liked him and he liked me and he asked me to be his girlfriend. I felt really special at this, like, oh my goodness, the guy likes me. It wasn't anything major. I think we held hands once. Though I felt very guilty at the time, it was like my first crush, like my first boyfriend. When I went home, I went to tell my parents. My parents looked at me and laughed and basically said, yeah, you're not allowed to date until you're 18. It turned out that the leaders, they already knew about it because the leaders at the youth camp had told my parents. I guess they basically had to have a talk with this kid, you know, basically not approaching me and leaving me alone. And he like never came back to the church. I did start to kind of live a little bit of a double life of trying to be normal as possible at school and then being the perfect Christian daughter at home. When I was 17, this was my junior year, I was at a sleepover and I was by another kid. I just thought he was cute. We went for a walk. The next thing I know, you know, he's, we're on the ground and I remember just floating up above my body and being like, oh my, like looking down and being like, oh my gosh, what is happening to me? After that happened, all I could think was, oh, he must love me. I guess I'm going to have to marry this guy because this happened. It's like you pledged your for marriage and you're praying and God's supposed to bring that perfect guy to you. So, you know, I had all this mental gymnastics in my head, but at the same time feeling so shameful and guilty that I gave into that temptation. I ended up writing about it in my diary and my mom found it. She lipped out and she ended up sending me and my sister, who was two years younger than me, we shared a room. She sent us to church camp. When I got back, my mother had completely gone through all of my stuff in my room. She took everything off my walls, photos, posters, anything, got rid of my books, and painted Bible verses on my wall. And I was devastated because that was my space. That was my only space that I had at home, like, is my room and my half of the room. Speaking to my mom, she told me that she had to protect my sister from me because, so basically, I was being influenced by the devil and demons and the posters on my wall were demonic and the things I had in my room were demonic and that is why that happened to me with that guy. That senior year was really hard. I was 18. I was held back a year so I was 18 in my senior year and a guy had asked me out and I was allowed to have a boyfriend at this time because I was 18. And so I wanted to have some sort of control over my body. So this was my attempt to do that. And so I said yes to this guy. He turned out to be a narcissist. He was extremely abusive. He separated me from my friends, from my family. He to me, he ended up telling my parents that we were having my parents were so upset they ended up like taking the family car away so I was not allowed to drive to school. I was basically grounded as an 18 year old and I was literally being punished 
as a legal adult for having with my boyfriend. I went to Bellhaven University in Jackson, Mississippi. I went because I had a scholarship through theater. I was in theater in high school and I started dancing, like doing ballet and stuff. It was supposed to be a liberal a liberal arts college, though it was actually not a real school because it's not accredited. At the time, I didn't know who I was anymore. I felt like I was just the bad kid. I went to parties and, you know, I all of a sudden had all this freedom because I wasn't at home. I ended up being violently by a guy that I knew and I had to go to the hospital. When I was checked by the nurse, she basically told me that next time I should just drink a little bit of wine, get some lube, and try again. Even though there was like, it was lots of stuff was torn up down there. I was like, oh, oh yeah, I guess it was just bad. That's what I told myself. So I'm thinking I'm a I remember being at a party and a man put his hand down my pants while I was dancing, like just little things like that. And like having him, having to see him in class the next day and being like, oh my gosh, like I keep, like the school was so small, like you see everyone all the time. So, and there was a rumor, I guess, that went around, someone posted something online that I was basically a and that I was sleeping around, which was not true at all. I ended up going to the dean to speak with them about this because I was so devastated. And the dean looked at me and he said, well, I don't know what you do in your personal life. And that was it. So it was like confirmed. Okay, I guess I am, you know, I'm a piece of trash. So yeah, I ended up failing out. One positive thing is I did meet my husband there. He was a dance major. He was my best friend. He really did uh, look out for me and keep me safe in many situations because I was so naive and getting into lots of bad situations just because I didn't know. I didn't have any life experience or boundaries or anything. I was room to be submissive to men and I'm the gatekeeper. Everything is my fault, but now I have no value. So yeah, I went back home. It took time for me to find myself. Through my early 20s, I really, really tried to um, just figure out who I was. My parents, when I first came back, they put me into an outpatient program and they diagnosed me with borderline personality disorder, which now I know is just complex PTSD. I know now that at the time I was just not processing all the I had experienced over a three years time from different men. And but I was there because I was with my husband. So basically, my parents sent me there because I smoked weed. Eventually, I couldn't do it anymore. I was at home. I was 19 years old. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I ended up going and spending the night at my now husband, his place. And my parents basically told me that if you're not going to obey our rules, you can't live here. And I was being a bad example to my siblings. So I was kicked out. I moved in with my now husband and we lived in this tiny room that he was renting out for 250 I had to find my first job as a server. You know, I had to just figure out everything on my own, not really having anything and just kind of starting from the ground up. And my husband and I, we were just kids. We were just kids trying to navigate this world without, you know, any support. We struggled a lot. We struggled through this time and I felt that all these things were happening to me because I wasn't following God, because I was living in sin. It's really sad. I feel like I was not present throughout my 20s, that I was just surviving in survival mode and then constantly feeling like nothing. I got married when I was 24. I really feel I got married mostly because I felt so ashamed that I was living in sin by living with my now husband before we were married. So yeah, we got married and then we had a kid. I had a very traumatic birth experience that ended in a C-section. After this, this is like when I finally felt that I was good enough to go back to church. So I started going back to church. We went as a family. I was baptized and, you know, all these things. And it wasn't up until 2020. My daughter had just, um, she was two years old and I was looking at her. All of a sudden it had clicked in my head. Anything that had happened to me, I would call it that's like, it just, it was a light bulb that went on in my head. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like what happened? What, like, Wait, and so I had to like go back and like process all this because I had not even accepted that. I didn't even think I'd been, I didn't even think like any of that, had, like at all. I didn't think that. So I had to really pull out all these memories and figure out 
why I felt the way I felt. Like, why did I not know for so long? Why? So I started unpacking purity culture. And I was like, wow, so this is really connected into like Christianity. So I really start unpacking Christianity and pulling that apart. And I was like, I was duped. None of this is real. You know, I was 28. I was laying down on my bed, looking up at the ceiling. And I said, God, if you are real, show me right now. You need to show me right now because I can't do this anymore. I can't do it. Of course, nothing happened. So it was like, I'm done. And so after that, I started pursuing trauma therapy. That has been opening a whole can of worms and just little memories here and there coming out and processing things that happened with my mom and having to approach my parents and kind of tell tell them all these things and you know it's it's been a huge process of having to realize that like my whole life I feel like my childhood was taken away from me that my early 20s was taken away from me because I was so I was disconnected from my body and just so up in my head so yeah Mostly with my mom. I've always had a weird relationship with my dad because I was always afraid of him. So I really did the talking with my mom. And that was really, really hard because I was so close with my mom. And just having to realize she took part in a lot of the abuse. And I had to explain that to her. And she has said she's sorry. And she's in therapy and on medication and kind of working through it herself. So we're still kind of learning how to navigate these things. Like I said, this just happened in 2020. I mean, I guess it's four years now, but like it's been a very long process of healing and slowly talking to my parents about these things. And it's just, it's very complicated because it's hard to tell your mom that like you tried to do your best to create a safe home. Like they did everything right according to the church, everything right. Everything they did is what the church would have recommended. You know, like they homeschooled us, they sheltered us. And, you know, when I started acting out and rebelling, they like, you know, threw me out of the house and, you know, they were doing what they were supposed to do. And like now they look back and they're like, wow, that was abusive. And they are so much different now with my younger siblings. And I was really the one who had to break the ice for everyone. And I'm having to find myself for the first time, learn how to just like myself because I'm so used to hating myself, so used to thinking that I'm worthless. I don't even know what my sexuality is. I literally don't even know because that development, that developmental phase, I feel like was taken away from me. So I go through phases of like, I don't know, am I asexual? Or maybe I'm bisexual. I don't know. I don't know what I am because, you know, I'm learning these things for the first time. And it's it's hard. It's really hard to look back and be like, all these things were taken away from me. It's really, really hard to look back and just, I don't know if you've heard of Marlene Winnell. So she wrote the book, Leaving the Fold. And she came up with the term religious trauma syndrome. And she really focuses on inner child. So when I picture myself and I kind of like go back in my mind and to that little girl who was going through those things, I just feel so heartbroken. I wish that someone had told me, like, you know, I told my mom this. I wish someone told me it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. You know, you're perfect the way you are. There's nothing wrong with you, you know, but... I didn't get that. It was just shame, shame, shame. Like, what was the point of living? Like, I just, in college, my boyfriend had broken up with me towards the beginning of the year. And I actually ended up on suicide watch at the school because I wanted to end my life. And because I just felt I didn't want to live anymore because I felt like I was supposed to marry this guy because I had to with him. So yeah, there were plenty of times throughout, you know, my young adulthood that I just didn't want to be here because I felt like I was worthless. Now I'm trying to heal so I can help my kids love themselves. I'm really trying to, and it's, it's hard when you're parenting and like, there's a lot of triggers, a lot of triggers because it, you know, there's this programming of how I'm supposed to parent. And then I'm like, wait, 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 nope, that's, that's toxic, you know? And then I know that my parents, their trauma affected the way they parented. So I'm trying to make sure that my trauma is not affecting the way I parent. Like it's, it's a lot, you know, I'm on my healing journey. I am a birth and postpartum doula. I do lactation after my first birth. 
that was very traumatic that inspired me to become a doula. And I love it. I'm very, very passionate about it. I'm taking a little bit of a hiatus right now because um, I'm home with my kids. But I'm very passionate about helping women of color in the birthing room and birth justice. One of the things that was hard with leaving Christianity was realizing that my purpose was gone. Because you're told that your entire purpose of being on this earth is to serve God, is to love Jesus. And I was told that over and over and over again by my mom. My mom would tell me, because her dad used to tell her this, like, you're not going to live you're not going to live to see 40. Jesus is going to come back by then. You know, so, you know, that is all I thought about all the time. And so all of a sudden, I, I mean, to learn, like, no, I have to create my own purpose. So that's been a, a learning journey of, you know, wanting to help other women and, um, and just being a better mom to help my kids.